Okay. Okay, I think we're live. So today is the March meeting for the curriculum subcommittee. Um, Dr. Henkel, if you'd like to do our introductions for who's participating today, and then we'll get into the minutes. Great. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kingsley. We are excited to be here today to um, collaborate with the Board of Education members, focusing on our initiatives relative to teaching and learning. Um, we have a series of um, kind of presentations to provide you with. So we're very excited to be joined by our curriculum instruction leader for secondary science, Beth Lancaster. We have our high school library media specialist, Kara Sweezy with us today. And um, we also have Riley Rappaport from our, um, who is our secondary uh, curriculum and instruction leader for mathematics, supporting some of the conversation uh, today as well. I just want to remind everyone, um, some of our norms when we're meeting virtually is we always try to have our cameras on at all times, and we are muted unless we are presenting. We want to um, be present and engaged, always ask questions because we are focusing, focusing on seeking to understand and keeping our discussion and comments um, on point uh, relative to the agenda that we've uh, designed. So um, I am good to go. Okay, we only have one set of minutes to approve, and that's our February 2024 minutes. Any um, discussion before we move to approve? Sounds good. Can I have a motion? Do you need official language on that, Bernie? I don't have the language. I, I think you can say so moved. Uh, so moved. <laughs> all right, all in favor? Aye. I'm going to abstain. I was not present. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. All right, great. So um, we're going to start with our um, our presentation, which completes our digital literacy and um, uh, techn district technology goal presentation. As many of you have, who have been with us over the last couple months uh, know that we've been um, looking at our K through 12 trajectory around digital literacy and technology. And what has evolved from our last presentation was a conversation also around engineering and computer science and how those connect to some of our digital literacy and technology goals that we've been focusing on this this past uh, school year. So I'm gonna um, I am gonna lead the convers lead the presentation, but I'm gonna ask um, Kara Sweezy, who is our library media specialist at the high school, um, and who is joined with uh, by Beth Lancaster, our secondary science cell, and Riley Rappaport, our secondary math cell, to kind of lead our discussion and close up this. Um, this series around uh, digital literacy and technology and then we'll open the floor for discussion before we move into the curriculum and instruction updates so i'm just going to switch let me know if this actually works because i embedded the links this time versus have separate ones i think yes no thumbs up no not so yet okay hold on Oh, I see it. I see it. All right. Excellent. Okay. So I believe Kara's going to, Kara, are you going to start or? I think Beth is going to start actually when we get to the second, go to the next slide. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Great. So, well, Beth. Ah, wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, having me back today to talk a little bit more about the technology that we have embedded within our courses at the high school. And I'm happy to be joined with a couple of my colleagues. Um, if you go to the next slide, Tina, just building on some of um, the foundation that was laid by Shelly and Sharon earlier in earlier presentations, as we kind of look at our courses and the trajectory for our students, we're really using this set of standards to, to guide our alignment um, and also inform some of our future work around that. Uh, we've looked at all of uh, our courses and some of our extracurricular activities at the high school and Kara is going to talk to um, some of the different places where we're seeing uh, all of these things transpire. Yeah, so this um, graphic, if you want to just go back, Tina, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, this graphic was created uh, with Helen, myself, and Beth, um, where we're looking at all of the areas where technology plays a part. And it's, re it's really hard to separate when you're looking at the high school because technology is embedded in so many different areas and in every department. So Beth um, is going to give an overview, talk about course-specific um, 
technology engagement, but then also talk a little bit about where technology appears in all areas. And then I'm going to talk specifically just about the Library Learning Commons um, role in digital literacy and the technology support that we provide as well. And Riley's gonna chime in and talk about our computer science pathway. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and start off with our technology and engineering pathway. Um, it consists of four different PLTW courses, Introduction to Engineering Design, Principles of Engineering, Civil Engineering and Architecture, and Digital Electronics. I kind of painted this sort of pathway um, and it culminates in an opportunity for our students to gain 12 college credits through the Rochester Institute of Technology Technology, but really, um, this pathway can be entered at different points, um, depending on when students might transfer in um, to our school or perhaps have an interest in engaging in some of these courses. So, for example, you don't have to take Introduction to Engineering Design um, to take Principles of Engineering, right? There might be some circumstances where a student might enter right into principles of engineering and so um, our our course instructor really has um, been flexible and engaging all students in in getting interested in technology and engineering and opened up these courses but this four course progression um, amazingly provides an opportunity for 12 credits. So I'm gonna dig a little bit into some of the projects that students are doing in each of these courses um, to really paint a picture of, of how students are, are learning how the technology works throughout them. Tina, do you mind advancing to the next slide? So our grade nine and 10 courses are Introduction to Engineering Design. And that really starts off with students um, building on their skills from middle school. Last um, meeting I highlighted in grades six, seven, and eight, what they were doing were building on those skills and using computer-aided design um, and the design process uh, for some projects. In um, this particular course, one of the projects that st stood out to me is um, students are using mathematics um, to design a CAM, right? So building on that mechanical um, technology that they were learning how it works in middle school to actually 3D print um, an automaton. Uh, and they usually connect these to their personal interests or hobbies. So there's a video embedded in this one. Tina, if you want to play it and you can see some of those um, projects that students completed. So again, 3D printing their own cam to um, make these, these all work. I like that students have a lot of voice and choice, right, in, in this particular project and can really um, focus in on their personal interests. In uh, Principles of Engineering, students are um, building on some of the work they did in grade eight um, with robotics. Um, this course really looks at career exploration um, and topics in engineering and math. Um, students are using um, breadboards, multimeters. They're using that VEX substructure that they um, were using in eighth grade and continuing to build upon that. Um, they participate in some class-wide competitions on manipulating the speed and torque lift of some of the um, robots that they, they build. Um, they also uh, work with some alternative energy resources, um, building hydrogen fuel cars, which I think is is kind of going to the wayside and we're going to be exploring some other alternative um, energy uh, projects as well in that class. In grades uh, 11 and 12, um, we offer civil and engineering and architecture. Um, in this course, students are really looking at how the technology um, of residential design, commercial design, and architecture come together. Um, one project that students engage in is designing the floor plan for a single family affordable home that meets um, Habitat for Humanity, residential, and ADA regulations. So, you know, understanding all of that and then putting that together um, with actually creating a 3D model um, of the home that meets all of those regulations. Um, they're exploring things like sewer lateral line design, rainwater runoff, so all of these technologies that need to be considered um, when you're designing um, a residential home. Digital electronics is going to be a new course that will um, be offered next year. Um, in this course, students are really looking at um, 
how does the technology work behind um, circuits in making decisions? Um, they're using integrated circuit chips. And uh, some of the projects that they'll be exploring um, are things like how do toll booths work, right? So they might, they're going to do a toll booth simulation. Um, how do drawbridges work? Um, how do you clear a paper jam in a, in a, in a copier? So how are all of those pieces um, working? And we're learning that through that technology. I'm going to turn it over to um, Riley because she's going to speak to our computer science pathway in those courses. Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to meet you all. Um, I look forward to working with you in the future and also um, about math, but also computer science. Um, computer science is not my specialty. I am not certified in computer science in any way. And I um, got that today when I was in one of the coding two classes. I was like, wow, these kids are way, know way more about this than I do, which was really, really cool. But um, our pathway is not very linear. So we have um, and it again, like kind of like Beth said in the engineering pathway, kid students can enter the coding pathway whenever they see fit. Like they could they could take an intro to coding course junior year if they want to learn a little bit more about it. So um, we have intro to coding, um, which after intro to coding, you can actually go to computer science principles um, or into coding two. Um, intro to Coding and Coding 2 are both semester courses. AP Computer Science Principles and AP Computer Science A are full year courses. Um, and then from coding, you need Intro to Coding and Coding 2 in order to go into AP Computer Science A. Uh, and then there, we have students who also take both AP Computer Science Principles and AP Computer Science A. Students who are very um, interested in computer science and probably will go on to study it in college. So. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the two, the intro to coding and coding two, and then the AP courses as well, if you want to go to the next slide. Yeah, before you go on, Riley, I just want to add a little context to um, relative to, um, you know, computer science is one of those, it's a shortage area, full disclosure, <laughs> right? And so it is one of those flexible types of courses where you can have a math teacher, you can have a science teacher, you can have a business teacher if we have people in the in the business field who may have a passion around coding and computer science where the state because of it being a shortage area has created almost like an alternate pathway for for multiple for any teacher who may be interested in computer science they can um kind of learn the background around computer science and take a state test yeah. Um, and then become a computer science teacher, which provides a lot of flexibility here in Weston mm -hmm. because we don't necessarily have to have computer science only fit in one department, right? So right now we have a computer science um, course that is taught by a math teacher, mm -hmm. right? But you can go to many different districts or even here within our, within our own district where we may have, you know, next year, we may lean on a different teacher who falls within a different uh, cross certification because we have other teachers who are also uh, cross certified in computer science. So it does provide some flexibility in this area. Um, and I just wanted to make sure, you know, our board members and the public know that computer science is one of those unique pathways um, that the state has really provided open avenues for districts to look differently at computer science and the and the staff and personnel that we have to support um, really robust and high quality um, instruction in these areas. Yeah, so, it's really um, it's really cool. And our math teacher who's currently teaching the computer science is also very passionate about it. So I feel like you find these teachers in different subject areas who have a passion for it, which comes through. So if you wanna go to the next slide. Okay, so for the semester courses, um, they focus on Python and students are doing some basic coding in the introduction to coding. And then they're, they start doing object-oriented programming in coding two, which is also using the Python language. Um, and I learned a little bit about it, but in coding two, so intro to coding, they do, they learn a lot through using videos and it's kind of individually paced and it's a lot of procedural coding. And then once they get to coding two, they do some work in groups. Um, so this is a class I've gotten to see the last two days. And one of the projects that they were working on, they do a lot of collaborative coding. Um, they were doing a Mad Libs. So the kids had to, there was no really structure to it. They could come up with however they wanted to set it up. Um, but they had to all 
come up with a way to create a Mad Lib game that you could enter in the words. It, could, it would prompt you for an adjective, a noun, or whatever it was, and then it will replace all of the words in the Mad Lib with the words that were given. Um, and it was really such a cool experience to see how many different avenues the students were taking to get this done. I understood maybe like 20% of it. I've taken one computer science class in high school, but um, listening to the kids and their passion about it and just knowing that every group was solving this problem a little bit differently um, was really cool. And then also to just see the collaboration. The kids really understood the importance of collaborating on the projects to um, find the most efficient code because it's not just about find, making the code work. But as Ms. Reens was saying to the class, like whatever group has the most efficient code as well. Um, I didn't know, but she was that they really talked about it, the code being pretty. I was like, that's cool. <laughs> um, okay, and then the next slide. Riley, Tina, yes. Beth, you all want us to hold questions? You want to ask questions as we go? What's best for you? Why don't Why don't we let them flow with their thinking and the presentation, and then we'll circle back. Sounds good. So if you could just add some notes, that'd be great. I'm sorry, I should have said that in the beginning. Perfect. Um, and then computers, so this is the difference of kind of between computer science principles and computer science A. They both have um, AP computer science, sorry, principles and AP computer science A. They both have an exam at the end. However, part of the exam is a portfolio in computer science principles. And in computer science principles, it's kind of like a co college semester intro to a computing course. Um, so it's not necessarily code heavy. Um, but it's it's using data and it big emphasis of it is working collaboratively as well. So if you look at the picture there, that's one project they did where they created an interactive pie chart um, to show some data, but it's creative problem solving within the data, not necessarily always going to code right away. And they submit a portfolio at the end of it. And then the computer science A is kind of what you would expect kids really learning the lang the Java language and it's exam based. So they take an exam at the end of it. I think I'm passing it back to Beth. Yes. <laughs> uh, so in addition to our um, engineering and technology and computer science pathways, we can see some of um, the, the data analysis and some other technologies being used in our, our core curricula as well. And of course, this is an area for us to, to further explore. Um, in addition to our core curricula, we also offer a number of elective courses that are using um, technology, digital illustration and animation, music production. Um, these are a couple examples of student work from that digital illustration um, course. Um, music industry, contemporary media design, videography, our Trojan news. Um, Kara is going to talk a little bit about that. And then our science research course. These are all places where we also see technology um, outside of those pathways. We also offer a number of um, enrichment opportunities. Uh, in the science department, we have um, a few of these. We have our science Olympiad team, um, which does compete in the state tournament. Actually, it's coming up over April vacation. Um, this STEM competition does have some specific technology and engineering events, um, among other avenues in which students can explore. Um, our teams uh, uh, group also competes. Um, they actually recently um, competed, they do a competition in school and then they submit their results. Um, they were designing, um, they were writing an essay, but then also building a prototype of a storage facility that could be used on some other celestial body in the uh, future. Um, so again, a couple other ways in which we can see technology um, sprinkling in within our offerings at Weston High School. In addition to those, if you go to the next slide, Tina, um, we have our VEX Robotics team. I highlighted the uh, middle school team in our last meeting. Um, the high school team actually just recently um, competed at Total Mortgage Arena. Um, we have to give a shout out to our coach, um, Rebecca Kaplan, who um, helped organize bringing this event here to Connecticut. It usually takes place in a high school um, in Massachusetts, uh, but we hosted um, this year with, with other um, 
volunteers throughout the state. And um, this really, I, I was actually able to go to it and it was a, a, an amazing opportunity for our students, um, especially those who are graduating seniors that are on our uh, high school robotics team, because you really felt like you were in a special place, right? When you're, when you're doing your thing in an arena and we had a team um, that actually made it to eliminations on that day. So they're, they're competing with some of the top world teams and, and we made it um, that far. So it was a wonderful way for our students to to end their season and those pictures are um, all from that particular day. It's like the NCAAs for robotics. It, it, it was it was really um, it was really excited exciting and I think that um, they're going to continue to try and offer it in a venue similar to that so students can have that experience. Um, we also have an American Computer Science League um, team. Um, this competition is really uh, it's just sort of a paper and pen, but we have a, a small group of students who are really, really interested in computer science and they're exploring those concepts um, with peers and um, another one of our teachers who is also computer science certified um, is the advisor um, for that group. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Kara. She's gonna talk a little bit more about our new studio. Hi, everybody. Um, it's Kara Sweezy. I'm the library media specialist here at the high school. Um, so first, I'll start with just talking a little bit about the technology enrichment with the Weston Weekly, and then I'll get into my role in the library. Um, I put in a clip here, uh, Tina, I don't know if you want to play it. It's quite lengthy, actually. Um, but if you know if the Board of Education members would like to see, this is something that we play in our packed meetings on Wednesdays. Um, it is a group of students that choose to participate. They meet after school um, where they build um, segments that, that really bring our community together. Um, so it's news, you know, Weston News. It's about athletics. It's about um, promoting um, mean Girls, it's um, also doing just funny segments as well, um, where we have a group of kids who like to ask silly questions, they get staff involved, um, and you know, it's entertaining and, and they're learning, obviously, using the things that they've learned in the videography program, and this is managed by Jeff Brencher, who's um, amazing, and we have a phenomenal news studio where the students get to work with the green screen and um, learning how to edit and collaborate and build some a weekly program. Um, and I'm, I'm often featured as a staff member in it where the kids ask me silly questions. But um, Tina, do you wanna ask something? Sorry. Yeah, I, was, I wanted to see it. Is that okay if we play it a little bit? Sure. Great. Hello and welcome back to Weston Weekly. I'm your host, Isabella. Be sure to contribute to the Super Bowl by February 14th. All non-perishable food donations will go to person to person. Check out the posters around the school to see what you can donate. And here is a short message from Gianna and Nivy with more information. Hey everyone, it's Nivy and Gianna. We're so excited to remind you about the February 14th food drive. Please donate non-perishable food items to your advisory class. The winning advisory groups will compete in fun activities at the February 14th pep rally. Get excited, see you then. Thanks girls. Weston Parks and Rec is running a ski day trip on Monday, February 26th to Mountain Snow. Registration closes on February 9th. Are you interested in learning more about softball? Come and join us for an introductory meeting on Wednesday, February 28th at 3 o'clock in the cafeteria. This is a meeting for new and returning players. Attention all baseball players. Is there a segment that does the interview with the adults at all? If you scroll there, oh, yeah, there, you go. there, oh, there you go. Ready? <laughs> it's in and out this year, not the burger place. Welcome back. Um, Ann is reading chicken nuggets. What's in is a clean desk. I heard baggy pants are in, so I just kind of copies. Hydration. Grades. It's less charging TV. <laughs> Sick. I like that. Out or piercing. A messy, a messy desk. A messy desk. Yeah. Germs. Outer germs. Mm, but last year germs were in. In is South Korea winning, and what's out is them losing. In is you know eating, sleeping, breathing. In is. <laughs> Oxygen. Out is nitrogen. Yes. 
Mmm. Tomorrow's Mr. Sadler's birthday. How does that make you feel emotionally? Uh, really good, actually. 800 years ago today, he was born. <laughs> yeah, about that. And how do you feel about tomorrow being Mr. Sadler's birthday? Static. How am I celebrating? Um, spreading cheer, because that's what he would want everyone to do. Nice. <laughs> Spread Sadler cheer, singing loud for all to hear. And going to Disney World. When you wish upon a star. <laughs> I like your eyes. I thought that, that's, a, that's a good place to stop right there. Yeah, it's, no, it's so... I, they, I'm addicted. It, I'm hooked. It's really funny. And they often um, feature Mr. Sadler. I, you know, if, I don't know how many of you are familiar with him, but he does not very... He doesn't like to be featured, so the students lean in on him being featured. And so it's become um, a very entertaining element of the week, Weston Weekly. Um, but those students do that... To, on their, hello, and welcome back to Weston the students do that on their own time. You know, they're obviously filming during school and then they have to edit and put all of that together. Um, so, okay, we wanna go to the next slide. Um, so I am new to this role this year. Um, I've been in Weston for 21 years um, and in the social studies department. Um, so I've really seen the changes in libraries over my career. Um, and at, when I, a, when the position became available and I applied for the role, I really wanted to sit down and think about what my vision was and, and do research and understand the changing roles of libraries. Um, and so I put together a vision statement, um, which are on these slides that you can read. I'm not gonna read that to you. Um, libraries are now referred to as learning commons. Um, I, I believe that name will probably change again in the future to include more like digital media, um, you know, spaces um, will always be a place housing books, of course, but libraries have now become um, a community meeting point, a hub of activity. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide, Tina. Um, libraries are no longer silent. You know, when we all went to school, um, and to some extent college, depending upon the recency at which we attended college, you know, there were often uh, staff members shushing everyone, silence for all. And now that that whole dynamic has completely changed where there are quiet places within libraries, but because of people's ability to kind of shut off from the world with headphones, people can create silence in any anywhere that they they want to be. And so now we see libraries as places where there is collaboration, where there is noise, where there are group meetings, um, where students can come for instructional support, where there are guest speakers meeting with kids. You know, it's just libraries. And if you look at it on a community based level and you look at it within schools, um, it is it has become really a, such an important part of every school building and community. So in our LLC, I included a couple pictures. We offer instructional support in math and writing all day. There are teachers staffed and students know that they um, are able to go in any space within the library at any time. So there's no areas just dedicated to staff. It's all open to students. Um, we often see students collaborating, working um, in the maker space. We also have a maker space just like the middle school, um, which I have a list of, of available items for students to work with in there. Um, we have two classrooms that are available for teachers to sign out through Throughout the day. Students also use them for group and collaborate, collaborative meetings. Um, student groups meet in here before school and after school. We are open, um, technically open at 7.30, but I come in every morning at 7 a.m. because there are students waiting to get in the library. Um, Dr. Hankel was in um, recently before school and she's like, what is going on in here? I said, this is, this is how it is all day, every day. The Weston High School Library is very busy um, and the students feel very comfortable, which is the, the environment that I want to encourage. They feel comfortable coming in and comfortable asking for support. Um, Miss Nice, my assistant and I are, um, you know, really here to serve the kids and the staff in every possible way we can so that we can make their experience as positive as possible. If you want to go to the next slide, Ms. Hinkle. So some of the things that I've done um, as I've tried to shift the library and and really get the kids to engage with me um, is every day we do these little um, activities like would you rather battles where we've done all of these different March Madness brackets starting since the beginning of the school year. Um, one of them we did was a pizza battle where the kids voted for their favorite pizza place. Um, and 
Colony Grill one. So then I had Colony bring pizzas in for all the students um, at the end of the school day to celebrate. But, um, you know, these seem like minor things, um, but they're actually really important because it gets kids in the library and also gets me talking to them. I need to know, I my personal goal is to know every single student in this building by first name, first name, last name. And in order to do that, I need to have a starting place to talk to them, um, to, to initiate conversation. They initiate conversation with me. Um, so some of these engagement activities that's one piece to the puzzle. The second piece um, and the largest piece is to increase reading and literacy. And so creating, um, you can see a couple pictures here with book displays, trying to embrace all the different celebration and heritage months. A couple of the pictures I put in here are um, Holocaust Remembrance book display. We had a Hispanic Heritage book display. We had a Black History Month book display. We currently have a Women's History Month book display. I've also engaged with the different clubs in um, the school that we have a space in the front of the library where they can design um, a display for their club or organization that incorporates the, the celebrations of the different months. Um, so that's been really great to work with the kids on that. Um, having been a teacher here for so long, this year has been easy, you know, in a way that the students know me, they see me as a teacher. Um, it's going to get more difficult as students don't know that I was once, you know, an AP teacher for, for so many years. So that's what's so important to me is that they continue to see me as teacher first, you know, and librarian second. If you want to go to the next slide, Dr. Hankel. Um, so something else that I've incorporated this year is really trying to build the library as a space where students can learn more about things that are happening outside of Weston and also outside of our high school. Um, each month I've brought in guest speakers, which have been highly attended by students. Um, October, we had a speaker from the Mohegan tribe in honor of um, Native American Heritage Month. Um, November, we had an amazing Veterans Day panel. Uh, December, we had a speaker from the Red Cross that came along with January. Uh, um, we had three Holocaust Remembrance speakers. Um, and then I started bringing in some local residents to talk about their career paths. Um, and it, this is new. This is all something new that I, I wanted to do this year, not, not really knowing how that would work. And it's been so well received by the students. I had over 60 students attend. Um, a guest speaker with the Simon & Schuster Publishing, she spoke about the books that, you know, what she does in the publishing industry. And then in, um, just last week, I had a speaker come in who works for Google. Um, and I had about 55 students attend that. So. Um, we're doing this during the school day. Students get passes. Their teachers permit them to come. At the end of the month, we're having um, a speaker come from the Weston Historical Society talking about the movers and shakers of women in, in history in Weston. In April, we have um, a New York Federal Reserve educational director coming in and also a food scientist from PepsiCo. Um, so I've been working really hard to develop contacts in the community. Um, and as I said, it's it's been really overwhelming from not just students, but also staff members who have been really interested to attend on their own during their free period. Sorry, my lights just went out. Um, okay, next slide, Dr. Hinkle. Um, and then here is really the, the most important part of what I do, besides getting kids to read, um, is getting into the classrooms and teaching the digital literacy skills, um, the digital citizenship, the research skills, um, the importance of source attribution, the importance of how to use technology. Um, and these are examples. There are all of these contain links. I didn't intend upon going through each of these individually with you because of you know the time of this, but uh, uh, you can go through them on your own. They're all linked um, to different documents or slideshow presentations. Um, last week, I visited most of the language arts classes, grades nine through 12, promoting reading across America and book talking some of the newest texts that we got in both fiction, nonfiction texts. Um, I also have offered a couple raffles that if students take books out um, before Christmas, uh, before the holiday break, and then before April break, I put their name into a raffle and I get them a gift card to a local restaurant. So that's been promote little incentivization programs just to promote reading amongst the high school kids. Um, because many kids do not recreationally read, unfortunately, once they get into seventh or eighth grade. I was just reading an article about it. Um, you know, it, we all know it's so valuable. We all know it's so important. But many students, when when they do get um, smartphones, you know, they don't, it's not, it's not, 
they can't say that this is for sure the reason, but they're finding correlations between when kids get access to more technology and more individualized technology, they then do not read as, as frequently for pleasure. Um, so my work is going to be, you know, really increasing that circulation, getting high interest books in our library, um, promoting that through book clubs, getting into library, um, getting into language arts classrooms and other subject areas. Um, I've been going into the grade nine classes, working on um, source selection, showing kids how to properly research. Um, I worked with health classes. I've worked with social studies classes. I've worked um, through PACT. PACT is our weekly, as I said, program where students meet with an advisory teacher on developing lessons um, for students about um, source development. And also today, um, there was one lesson, that's the PACT lesson plan that you'll see linked in there about um, AI and what that means for plagiarism, you know, something that we're all really trying to navigate as we understand more about the use of AI um, in education. Um, next slide. Um, and these are just a list of different resources that we have avail available to the students. Um, you can read through this. I mean, our hottest items that we are that we are checking out to students are chargers <laughs> um, when it comes to technology needs and graphing calculators. Um, I've also worked really hard to increase our audio and ebook collection. Um, I brought in Sora, um, which is actually throughout the district now. It is a free program um, that offers audio and ebooks. And through the Sora program, I have also connected with our uh, public library so that the students have free access to all of the public library audio and ebook collection as well. And that can all be done through their Google single sign on through ClassLink. Um, so I personally, um, I love a book, holding a book, reading a book in my hand. Um, and, you know, research shows us that that does lead to better comprehension. It obviously uses different parts of our brain when we're talking about audio and ebooks versus holding a book in your hands. But, or I should say, and I want students to have access to any materials that get them to pleasure read. And then hopefully we get more checkouts, you know, in our circulation in the library as well. Um, I think that is going to, oh, next steps, next steps. Beth and I are going to wrap this up. Um, so my work is going to continue to be getting my standards embedded within all of the core curricular areas so that I become very much a part of the classroom experience for all of our students here at the high school. Because I already have these amazing relationships with so many staff members, I have been so busy and so um, much a part of all of the classrooms. Um, and I look forward to continuing to build on that. Beth? And I'm just going to wrap it up with saying that, you know, we know that there are still opportunities to explore and really leaning in on what are our students' interests um, so that we can continue to provide those enrichment opportunities that incorporate um, technology and digital resources. So we would love um, to answer or any questions that you might have now. I think Riley's still with us as well. Well done, ladies. I just wanted to also um, celebrate the three of you. I hope that you, the, the community and the board members have really seen how our library media specialists are really, um, I, I say to them a lot, you're the Velcro to a lot of our, to all of our content areas, right? Because they are, as Kara mentioned, you know, they're weaving their standards throughout the content areas specifically and at the high school more so because, um, when you get to when you look at that K five trajectory, they they're almost used they're used differently than they are at the high school, right? Because those K five library media specialists are really they have specific classes that they pull out in into the library. And when you get to secondary, it becomes that shift happens where they're focusing more on you know explicit digital literacy lessons, digital citizenship, but also supporting research, writing skills site and source about validity and annotation and um and then also that idea of what is a library learning commons now and how has that evolved over the years is so exciting there is an energy um i'm sure you heard it in kara's presentation but it it is live and and true there's an energy in that um, library learning com commons at the high school um that has shifted this year and it's really exciting and I just commend you all for really working collaboratively to enhance the experience for kids and really find the passion projects or the niches for these kids to actually continue to, 
to read and use um, use those literacy skills throughout everything that they do. So yes, so I'll stop. So yeah, why don't Chad, what you want to start? And um, well, I know you probably has, have some questions that you want to um, ask the, the team. I do, but I'm actually going to tag either David or Bernie in because I, I need to go mm -hmm. off video for exactly three minutes to pick my kids up at the bus stop. I'll okay. be listening the whole time, but they're okay. uh, in the combined bus route. They're they're getting on the bus in a second, so I'll be I'll be listening. But David, Bernie, you go right ahead. Sure, David, you want to go first? No, go ahead, Bernie. I mean, I watched it. I'm a tech person, so I don't really have a lot of questions. Other and videography was something that was interesting to me back in high school. We used a VHS camera. <laughs> uh, so you know i think the size has gotten a little smaller but the content hasn't changed a lot you walk around the high school and you combination embarrass your peers and your <laughs> teachers right so i think it's cool i don't really have any questions unless bernie you ask something that you know spurs something from my mind but go ahead bernie Sure. Sounds good. Um, you know, they always say that one of the most important attributes of an educator is that they want to be a lifelong learner. And I don't know that there's any space that that's more relevant than in the technology space with how much is changing. And it was really impressive to see how much the students are doing and the adults being able to support that learning as well. So to be experts in their own space, learning in, in, in advance of the kids and then also with the kids. So uh, kudos to all of your hard work. You can really feel it. Um, I had one question, uh, two questions really about the computer science aspect of it. The first was um, in terms of Connecticut state guidelines and graduation requirements, where are we right now with computer science? And um, along those same lines, are all of the students engaging in computer science or is it still more of an elective? Great question, Bernie. I was I had a post-it note to circle back around computer science. I'll start and then maybe Megan. I just also wanted to say thank you to Laura Cadis, Megan Canetta, and uh, Patty Falbor for being here today too. Our principals are always supporting our teachers and the work that they do. And they oh, they don't have to be here. And I really appreciate that they support and and come on to listen to all the great work and chime in when necessary. Um, so I'm just gonna start. A couple things. The state of Connecticut um, has really been um, which with all I support, um, with all good intentions to support districts to really infuse computer science for all. If it were up to them, they would have a mandate that every student completes a computer science course by the time that they graduate, right? That's the whole computer science for all movement. Um, with When the new um, standards were adopted, um, which is relatively new, they've been in writing, but now there is a requirement that districts are have a clearly articulated pathway K through 12 um, to provide a better understanding of how we are addressing computer science standards in our environment. So it was really great to see, I don't know if anybody noticed over these last four presentations, but for us in Weston, we are beginning to design what computer science standards look like K through 12, because they do look different. We do not have a computer science or a computer teacher in K through five explicitly. So our library media specialists and our teachers will be working to map out where we currently have and are addressing computer science standards in K five and where we may have holes and how we are going to revise or update our curriculum to meet those, those standards. When you move to 612, as you saw in the last two presentations, you know, we are we do have engineering teachers, we do have specific core classrooms where we may be supporting more explicit instruction around those standards. So it shifts and looks a little bit differently. Um, so we will be um, designing and finalizing that plan over the next year or two. Um, the state has some models for us, um, but we're going to be leaning a lot on our uh, library media specialists, our computer science teachers, our engineering teachers to help us articulate this plan. And we've been doing a lot of curriculum unpacking this year to get a better handle around um, what are our course trajectories look like? How do we want to revise them? How do they help uh, support this work moving forward into next school year. And as you saw over the last two presentations, Project Lead the Way, Computer Science, and also um, ways that our library media specialists are supporting that integration of digital literacy, digital citizenship, 
uh, is going to help with that process as well. Um, David, or I'm sorry, Bernie, you asked about um, uh, high school uh, credits, correct, in this area? And maybe I'll have Megan, if you don't mind, jump in a little bit around um, that aspect of the question. Sorry, I had to mute myself. Are you asking how many credits kids have access to in computer science? That'd be interesting. Also, are are the kids all taking at least some computer science? Is it in their schedule or is it more of an elective where we're still um, having some students that aren't taking it as a option, but instead taking something else? It is an elective. So students elect to take those courses. Um, and they fluctuate from year to year. I can tell you that based on our course request for this year, we have an uptick. So like we had 12 students, for example, um, request AP computer science. This year we have 20. Um, we have an uptick in, um, let me just, compute, intro to computer coding. We went from like 27 interested in it last year to 33 um, this year. Um, PLTW. So we, we, I mean, it's there. Kids are interest. I think that that interest is also helped by the work that they're doing at the middle school and, and also looking at, you know, through um, guidance, some of the work that they'll do through career and interest inventories. Uh, and we're even seeing like the growth in our esports program. Um, I think in one element of esports, they're like number one in New England right now. I couldn't tell you in which game. Um, so we're, we're just continuing to make those opportunities available as we also look at our sequencing. Yeah, and I would like to add to, to Megan's point, what, what computer science has always seemed to be, um, because I, you know, I used to teach it when I was a high school teacher. And um, you know, we wanna make sure that we see that all students see computer science as an option. Sometimes it's scary. Some, some people, students see that they need to have this really strong background in a certain area in order for them to be successful in computer science. Um, and it's just not true. Right? It's a different, it's a language and it's a learned language and the language changes a lot, right? It sh has shifted from C++ to Java to Python. And what we are noticing and what, and I'm sure Dan can chime in here too, is and this is the big push for the state is recognizing that computer science and coding is, is more of a foundational skill that is really transcending across many different career pathways now and it almost is a is a skill that is going to help support kids when they move into any many types of career paths um you know so i'm really excited that kara is bringing in a lot of these outside speakers to kind of help kids make the connection to why computer science is important and will help them in so many different career paths moving on. Um, so like cybersecurity and new new um, fields that you know we don't even know exist, how it supports AI and, and data science and um, a lot of other pathways that maybe weren't even around when we were um, in high school ourselves. Makes sense. And are we using code.org for a lot of our courses? At the high school level, middle school, high school. Ladies, I don't know. I don't know that we'd be using code. I don't know, Beth. You could speak yeah, to that. They're using. Um, I, I think I, they use code.org more at the um, elementary or middle school level, not as much at the high school level. To me, code.org is a resource that helps kind of public access and student interest as they're experimenting with it. I don't know that that's um, the resource for our high school curriculum know that we're using Project STEM as a resource um, at the high school. Yeah, because the code.org code uses a lot more block coding to introduce the kids to the students to coding. And then once they get into more of the language based coding in high school, they use the Project STEM. And we are looking to understand better how Sacred Heart University, for example, is a code.org like representative and provider for districts. They're the liaison for us. Um, and so there's a variety of curricula and course opportunities K through 12 that through Sacred Heart University we can we can tap into. So um, throughout this process, we will be looking at um, having additional conversations uh, through that arena too. So um, but there are a lot of resources beyond just code high school, code.org 
um, that we can use that are free that we can actually integrate into our curriculum. So it's going to be an exciting couple years when it comes to computer science. That's great. And my last question, and this might not be one we can answer today. It might be one to answer in the future. Um, how are we doing in terms of our uh, achieving the access for all? If we look at the students who are taking our computer science, um, what is our, our demographic breakdown, um, gender breakdown kind of look like um, as representative of our entire community? Yeah, so I think Megan kind of started that conversation around right now it's an elective and it's a choice. Um, so I think this is what I was mentioning before, right? Providing more background and understanding for kids to see the connection and the purpose behind computer science and how it relates to other courses is something that we've been working on as early as sixth grade on up and building some more interest around that. So if it's not a requirement that every student completes a computer science course by the time they graduate from as it stands right now, correct, Megan? Um, it's part correct. of this. I think we also, like, I totally appreciate the computer science for all and like the thinking around, you know, access for all students. There have been programs historically like AP for all, right? Um, so sometimes we just have to keep in mind that we have 25 graduation credits that students ha have to make progress on. I think we also have to remember that students have access to eight periods in their schedule every year. And we also want students to, um, also gain the skills that they need in the areas that they also want to pursue because they're honing that and crafting that as they move through our progressions. So by their junior and senior year, they might have had an experience in some element of computer science, whether it's in middle school, and they might make some decisions that that's not the pathway that I want to, you know, so I just... I would call, I, I hear everyone, I hear the state's goals and all of that, but um, we also still have to, um, I think, really recognize the individuality of all students and kind of honoring their choices too, while also making sure that all kids can see themselves, right, and that we're encouraging and, and kind of sometimes, to Tina's point, removing any fear of like that computer science and like, oh, that's, you know, whether it's too much for me or I don't know enough about that. So making sure they're making informed decisions, I think would be our goal. All right. Did Chad come back? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been listening the whole time. I'm oh, absolutely great. here. Uh, great questions. Uh, let me build on those if that's okay. David, are you, you okay if I pick up or did you want to jump in with a question too? Chad, take it away. All right. So I applaud the idea of the computer coding as a, sort of a fundamental skill, and that's something I don't really know much about. But the question would be, who and how do we kind of uh, examine this every so often and make sure that the thing we're doing is the most current? As an example, like when and, and how do we evaluate if Python is still sort of the latest and greatest? And I guess even more broadly, if in fact coding is the latest and greatest thing that our kids should be uh, being equipped to do. So that'd be my first question. So I mentioned before, you know, when we think about curriculum review and revision, first off, we take a lot of direction from um, the state. We take a lot of direction from um, kind of the industry standard, especially around STEM education. And, and that's why I think it's very important to have articulated agreements and conversations with um, universities, as well as uh, career related um, industry leaders, right? And having those open conversations. Um, so our teachers through our curriculum revision and design process, that that's part of our work, right? Is to reflect on what we currently do, reflect on student experience, reflect on um, achievement and, and progress. And then we rely on um, kind of our colleagues and our industry at our industry standard to see if we're current and up to date in those areas. Um, it's it's kind of interesting because like I said, when, when computer science started years ago, you know, over a decade ago, C++ was the language, right? And, and then, uh, especially at the high school level, and then it turned into um, to Java, right? And so what, why did that change? Um, again, it was because we were looking at industry leaders like IBM, like Google, like, and who were they looking for as far as their foundational skills when they were hiring? And so that's why things started to shift. And I think it's important too to note that um, while a language is um, 
you know, utilize when we're when we're instructing and designing courses, it is important to note that kids now need to be more agnostic when it comes to language and language development and the foundation of coding and how to do that, regardless of the language that they um, are expected to use when they're when they're at their at their jobs and what their job is looking for. So that's my take on that question. I hope that answers that, Chad. <laughs> I'd just like to piggyback and add a little bit to that. There are constantly updates to the courses and the technology that's embedded with the courses um, through PLTW. So, um, you know, Aaron Lucia, our instructor, is adjusting and modifying all the time based upon what's being sort of pushed pushed down um, through those courses. Gotcha. Okay, I have another fun question, which is, so Carol, what are students doing in the library at 7 a.m.? Like, what are they lighting up for? They are coming in the library to work with other students, sit with other students. They are doing schoolwork. They are reading. They are printing. They are on their phones. They're relaxing. I mean, you know, it, it's it's a space that you could see any of those things, all of the things happening at the same time. You know, there are groups meeting, there are kids sitting alone, there are kids working on an assignment, um, you know, and there are kids who really come to relax. Like it is their space in the school where they feel the most comfortable, you know, to just sit and check out for a little bit. So it's checking in, it's checking out, it's the library. And even when you go to the public library these days, you'll see all of that, all of it. It's play, it's relaxation, it's work. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to give an, another response. Um, I'm going to say this, Kara. I think Kara's being modest, too, because they're also lining up. Kara and Jen, nice, in the library. They do these really fun brackets, whether it's, like, favorite water bottle, favorite pizza, and, like, they narrow them down throughout the course of the week, and kids are voting through their you know, marbles, marbles, yeah, whatever they are. Yeah, um, so Kara has just really created, and Jen, um, has created a really vibrant um environment in the library and kids like to be there and i think so much of that has to do with the climate that they've created thank you i appreciate and, that and like they can have a snack in there now right they can clean up after themselves and have a snack now yeah. you know it's not a quiet library so the libraries that we're used to from our experience in high school are in the days gone by so libraries are i don't know care you i'm sorry i've got i had to come off the meeting for a minute, but they, they are collaborative learning spaces. And that's really what Kara and Jen have done to that space. And it smells good. <laughs> it does smell. I have a lot of, uh, yes, good scented plugins. But yeah, I do let the kids eat in the library. I did some research on that too. So I went to some area um, colleges and universities this summer um, once I got the job because um, I wanted to look at what those spaces look like. Because, um, you know, in Weston, we're always trying to prepare our students for the next steps. Um, and I wanted to get an understanding of, of you know, what, what these college uh, environments are looking like. And so very often they're vertically articulated now at colleges and universities where the base level is the loud eating, talking. And then it, as you move up the floors, it gradually gets to the silence where you have the top floor that might be the silent study space. Our library, we don't have leveling. So, you know, I'm my goal, my ultimate goal that I've talked to, um, you know, Ms. Canetta and Dr. Henkel about is, is looking at a horizontal articulation of our library where we go from really collaborative to maybe more quiet, individualized spaces. And some of that, you know, it takes investment, you know, furniture and changing of spaces and um, genrefying the library is something that I, I'd really like to do. Um, you know, we're looking at libraries and schools now more as like a Barnes and Noble type model where you have all the genres separated out through fiction, through memoir, um, through topic. Um, and they've seen an increase in circulation in schools where that has happened. Um, but all of that takes time, you know, and I, I, you know, that's the first thing that, you know, Miss Canetta said to me when I got the job, she's like, this is a multi-year change. You cannot do everything year one. So just, you know, you have to pace yourself here and really get comfortable. And it's it's a step-by-step -step process. So um, in terms of the climate and the space and just getting kids in the library, we, we have achieved, you know, we are succeeding. Um, so the next steps are hopefully moving spaces around, moving resources around, um, you know, and, and ultimately, being a, a place that encourages literacy, both digitally and reading. And, you know, so, and, and these things are happening, which is exciting to see in year one, you know, that I've, I've 
only been here this time and to see the changes already is very exciting. And I appreciate the support of the board and um, all of my administrators in that. Cool. And then the thank you for the mm -hmm. thank you for all this. Uh, my my next question would be it piggybacks a little bit on something that you said, Kara. And I I guess it's again I don't know if this fits in this conversation or not, but it's a question about cell phones. If you're talking about how students do absorb or do not absorb information, and if they begin reading less once you sort of introduce uh, reading via technology, I'm not sure this fits in this conversation. But it's just because digital literacy and how students are using phones seems to track. And also we're getting more questions about that via you know, public comment and things like that in our larger meeting. I know that I'm the one who often puts my hand up on this issue, but I do sort of flag it for if we're thinking about how our students interact with technology, I guess it's just a, a question to the administration of what are we thinking about and where does that fit in terms of you know policy or curriculum or whatever about are phones allowed? Uh, how are they allowed? Those sorts of questions. I think we always have to remember that phones aren't going anywhere, right? That these are high schoolers, they're 13, 14 through 18 years old. And so really what we want to do is teach them responsible, respectful use of their phones. Um, you know, my cell phone is my walking computer and desk at times throughout the day. So we have created plans in the high school where students know that phones aren't out, or their phones are not out in the classrooms. They are either in their backpack, um, and we are specific in that, they are either in your backpack or they are in the phone pockets on the wall. They are teenagers, so are some gonna have it in their pocket of their pants? Yes, potentially, right? Um, and in some cases, the phones aren't a problem and they're away and they're not in the phone pockets and every, depending on the age of the student. Um, so we're really talking more about responsible behavior with your cell phones, understanding that that is an awesome communication device for kids. I think it's also a way for high schoolers to start to manage their own schedules and their own lives. Um, I see that in plenty of students here at the high school. I see it in my own children, that they know when their practice is, they know when their rehearsal is, and we want them to continue to take more ownership of that and really develop not only those time management skills, but that the planning, right, and communicating with adults, the other adults that are involved in their lives outside of school too. So we're, we are conscious of it. And that rule was put into place at the start of this year in response to like really mm -hmm. needing to um, all get on the same page about cell phone use in our school. And I mean, anyone can um, comment on that. I think it's working. I just wanted to also say um, what we've done at lessons now with the ninth through 12th graders impact um, on screen time awareness. So I created a lesson um, and I didn't want it to be judgmental, right? Cause I want, you know, I want to try to meet the kids where they're at, but let's talk, let's look at our screen time. You know, we can all look at it on our phones. How, how much are we using our phones? Is there, is, is it too much? You know, do you believe it's too much? And if you do, you know, what, what can you do to change that? What choices can you make? You know, um, and it was great because some of the kids said, you know, I used to read before I went to bed and now I'm on my phone and I'd like to challenge myself. So we asked all the students, you know, create a personal challenge. You know, what's, you know, I'd like to challenge myself to read again before I go to bed for pleasure, not for school. Um, so, yeah, I think having those conversations are absolutely critical. And it's something that we've been doing this year through our PACT program. Um, because if we come, if we say to them, you're using your phones too much, you know, and, and of course we can control the classroom environment. Um, I, I'd rather the kids come to their own recognition, you know, and I think some kids are doing that, you know, and realizing that there are better ways they could be using their time um, in some cases. Part of the reason I asked the question in the context of, of this meeting is that to your point, Megan, saying that, you know, phones aren't going anywhere. I agree with you broadly in society for sure, you know, worldwide. The question of are they going places in school districts, that's much more up in the air. And, you know, the, the parents who were showing up last couple board meetings were asking about, uh, you know, taking phones off campus, essentially. And there are some districts that are doing that. So I just think that as we're talking about digital literacy, the elephant in the room is not the beautifully curated moments of very intentional use of technology that you all are clearly from this presentation, fostering in the classroom, the elephant in the room is like the other, you know, 24 seven that, that the students are ingesting information and activity via devices. Yeah, and, and let's attack that for a moment, right? So these are life lessons. 
right? And I, I know that in Weston, before some of the uh, governor's position statements around removing, uh, if you look at the language, it's really not to remove, it's to monitor basically. But there are policies that Weston has adopted and revised to not just talk about cell phone use, but also any, the safe and responsible use of all devices, whether it's a smartwatch, whether it's a computer, right? This is this goes beyond the, the phone, even though the pervasive conversations about the phone because it's in their hand all the time, is what are our policies? What are our philosophies and beliefs around digital use and appropriate responsible use? And then the next layer is how are we enforcing what we say on paper is appropriate for us, for kids in Weston? And before any of that came out, we were already ahead of that curve. We had very large discussions. We made revisions. And from that, well, this was last year. And then from that, our, admin, our administrators and our teachers revised handbooks. We've been communicating with families around expectations and responsible use, as Megan talks about. I see the letters to the families at home. We all are in this together, right? Because it's one thing to put something on paper. It's another thing to what Kara is talking about, teaching, responsible use, lesson, especially when they get to high school, right? I have two high schoolers too. Like they have to use these tools to monitor themselves and recognize that if an adult is constantly making the decision for them and, and trying to create control and directives, when, when, the, when it's off and they have to do it themselves, they're not doing it, right? So how much time and energy are we supporting now to teach and provide some context around the why this is important to reflect and revise and make a life changes down the road. Um, and I think I know our administrators in West End have been in, have been re enforcing those policies and they've been making kids accountable and our teachers have the support from the administrators to ensure that those handbook expectations are being executed and we're monitoring um, the response, the respectable use and making sure that developmentally appropriate, keep things home. If you can't manage it and you're having a, a problem, then, you know, let's have a conversation with parents and have a conversation about how the student is or isn't using it respon responsibly. I know that at the elementary level, they keep them in their backpacks, right? Uh, you don't, if you need to call a parent, you, we have phones, you can come in the office and you can call them. You don't need to wear a smartwatch. You don't need to have a phone in your hand um in the lower grades i don't know so i just wanted to have a conversation because it yeah. keeps coming up and i know you know we've really been working on it and i know that our policies support it and i know that our handbook and our um, regulations and the systems and structures that we have in place are actually are working as megan said and we are changing behavior yeah I'm, i would also just say like anecdotally and this is just from doing a lot of reading and listening on this topic the issue is not cell phone use in high school. The issue, and I, or in schools, but I'm going to speak specifically to the high school. And because this is being recorded, I'm going to say what I always say. Please take them out of bedrooms. Please take your electronic devices out of bedrooms. Have them plugged in in another location in the home. Kids are up way too late often on their devices. And, um, and I think sometimes it also affects their efficiency in doing the work that's assigned for home too. Um, we see that all the time. Um, so just keep that in mind. A lot of um, the stuff sometimes we deal with that results from social media happens outside of the school day. So so I, I guess this, Tina, I guess the, the question would go to you. So when at public comment at the larger board of ed meeting, parents are asking about, you know, getting cell phones out of the district essentially, uh, is that a conversation to have here? Is that a conversation the administration should have? I honestly, I don't want to make all the people who just did this really clear uh, pedagogical walkthrough of how we're handling technology have a conversation about like a policy point, but maybe it is good to bring it up here. I don't know. What do you think? I think it's both, right? I mean, the principals can chime in here. We had a conversation about that after some of the public comment at the last Board of Education meeting. It was part to your point about elephant in the room. Like we wanted to, we wanted to be able to provide a, a good message and a, a clear understanding of that K-12 trajectory and the developmental use of, of digital tools and what is actually happening in the, in the buildings. 
Um, this is a partnership, though. I think that to Megan's point about, you know, we can only control what we um, have in front of us. And this is not just a school responsibility. This is a community responsibility and a partnership between parents and, and teachers and administrators and to support kids, right? And that developmental process of making good decisions. Um, and everybody's different around what the what the needs are, right? As you heard, you know, um, we we a, t a parent has every right to not purchase a cell phone for their children. My younger two don't have them, and they're middle school and below, right? Um, and so, but that's a that's a family choice, and we as a school are, you know, creating policies and our philosophy around how they are in either enhancing or inhibiting the instructional environment. But then again, beyond that, I think there were some comments that I think go beyond the school, as Megan was saying. Well, the, the part that does stick with the school, though, just because the people had raised it the last two meetings and some emails that have been going around now as well. Uh, what is, I guess, the administration or the district's position on the idea of removing uh, cell phones from campus? Can I jump in for one quick second? Sure. Uh, just to kind of bring the conversation back to curriculum, and perhaps where this conversation should take place. I might be wrong, and please correct me if I am. I don't think this is a curriculum question. I think this is a policy question. That's, that's what I was asking, David. I, that's, I have some questions about that as well. So that's why I'm kind of floating it. Yeah, and then related well, like, to- Like I said, I do think it's both though, David. I okay. think there's a combination of understanding how to use digital tools appropriately. And I don't want, it should be called out. And then the other part of the conversation I think is about you know, um, acceptable use, which is part of policy. Yeah, and then I guess my, my tag along question is, based on the presentation that we saw today, um, it doesn't, I think the question as it relates to curriculum is, I didn't see anything that would require or encourage a student to necessarily use their smartphone for anything out of scope for the assignment. So I saw like a student using their smartphone to take video. Whereas, you know, when I was in high school, we were carrying a VHS camera. So just to kind of make sure we're, we're on the same page, um, the use of the, of, the, of the mobile device, uh, the smartphone, for the purposes of the curriculum portion we're talking about, is to fulfill something within the, the coursework, right? There's no, you shouldn't have a child using Snapchat in the library if they're supposed to be there uh, filming yeah. and interviewing students. And to that point, CARA's curriculum or the digital literacy and digital citizenship curriculum is focusing more on acceptable use regardless of the device, right? <coughs> and that's how that connects to curriculum that Kara was mentioning about, you know, the, ex the example of her going into the classroom and talking about screen time, for example, right? About valid and reliable sources and, you know, how are they using the tool appropriately? not only in life, but also in instruction. I think, mean, yeah, and Chad, I don't know who, if there is an app out there, and if not, uh, someone should develop it. It's a geo, you know, basically it's an app that's geo, geo filtering based. And if, you know, we use Life360, right? We know when our, when our high school, our sophomore is at Weston High School, we know when he leaves it. So imagine an app that, and it may be out there, that when you are within the perimeter or, or uh, area of, of the schools, Certain apps don't work, like Snapchat, Facebook. I would be very interested in knowing if that kind of app works and if it uh, as out there. And if not, that would solve a lot of this problem, which is you know, is trying to bridge the gap between having a mobile phone for the purposes of communicating with family. And I know my sophomore and my third grader link up at the end of every day. My third grader walks over to the high school, and my wife texts my sophomore to make sure that they're linked up and uh, getting home. Uh, getting picked up so uh, i know we've deviated quite a bit from curriculum but that's the killer app to be had an app that would prevent snapchat and stuff uh those kinds of programs from working. your early retirement idea david right there you got it so i i just want to comment because again i have to think about the high schooler so our high schoolers are really effectively often using instagram facebook snapchat to create 
um, groups to communicate effectively. If maybe they're coordinating group work, maybe that's how they're sharing information about which game they're going to do. Um, you know, they're all going to come and be and have like a super fan group. So I, I just again, this is my opinion, working with high schoolers for 20 years now, I think we have to err on the side of, you know, I'm a teacher at heart, I always will be. So my first mode will be to teach them how to use this technology effectively. If we start to talk about restricting these devices from schools, from campus, the other piece of that puzzle is, you know, what's the work that we want done in schools all day? Because I could spend all day chasing down phones and, you know, fulfilling that kind of unfunded mandate to get phones out of schools. And then how are we, what does that really look like in enforcement when families, as you both just spoke to, right, really depend on these devices so much to communicate effectively with our children. So I just, I want to keep that in mind as we continue this conversation. My, my belief will always be to focus on the, the, the teaching of our best practices and for students to really, you know, help them come to the best possible conclusions given the way their teenage brains work. Well, it's a big enough topic that, and I don't know, again, if this is the right place for not, but it deserves a, a thorough examination because it has completely altered our society. I mean, you just, you mentioned a bunch of stuff there, Megan. I mean, I would suggest that there's multiple things there. On the one hand, do we essentially want to coach our students to organize themselves via private companies, which are Instagram and Facebook, et cetera, et cetera? We used to organize ourselves using other tools. So like, I'm, I'm not giving you a counterpoint that, that you and I need to come to alignment on it, but rather it's a big messy topic that we ultimately have to try to get our arms around. Yes, they're very powerful tools for organizing things, but they're also very powerful tools for distracting, wrecking attention spans to your, to your point, like rather insidiously monopolizing people's minds, not just kids actually. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that it, I, I think that yes, there are counterpoints about discipline, et cetera, but there's a whole bunch of data on the other side too about you know ways in which they're very, very toxic to our kids. So also trying to be reliable to the, the you know, population. Of course, I'm interested in the issue. You all know that, but also being responsible to the folks who are asking about it via public comment and stuff. I guess the question is, where is the appropriate way to kind of hash out this question of what policy should be? Can I just clarify, we are not teaching yeah. kids about Instagram and Snapchat, and we're not sending them in that direction to organize. They're they're doing it independently. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. yeah I, I, I misspoke if I was in, is suggesting that you know, teachers are organizing homework assignments via Snapchat or something. I'm sure that's not the case. I, I think we can circle back to this. I wonder if it's a further discussion offline between like, what is it we're looking to answer? Um, because I don't want to create, um, uh, I don't want to create more work when work's already been done, right? If there's something outlined in a policy or within something that we've already talked about relative to uh, tech tools or to effective use of technology, then let's, let's look at that or if there's a conversation around um, how we make decisions around quality technology tools to integrate into curriculum design that's a whole different conversation right which is kind of what we've been trying to also uh, paint a picture of around yeah. this k-12 trajectory yeah. um, around some of the use of a high quality technology tools to enhance the learning experience for kids um, so so maybe that's a maybe that's a discussion you and uh maybe bernie and you guys can talk about as far as there's a, a follow-up sure uh, topic. yeah to put kind of a bow on it, i think the simple question i just want to get some a sense of just to be able to respond intelligibly to the public comment we've been getting about it is is the administration open to or interested in uh removing cell phones from campus essentially like that's the the simple distilled question we don't have to answer it right now but that's mm -hmm. the the one that has been brought up a couple times in public comment and i'm also interested in based on the conversation but yeah, you know, I, I think what you should do is email uh steve and ask him to add it to an agenda item for a regular board of ed meeting because yep. it's something that should be discussed among the general board and i think to tina's point it may have to get distilled down to a subcommittee and then come back to the general board yep. but i think the first thing is we have a policy. I personally have not seen it, um, but not recently anyway. So I'm going to go look for it unless, Tina, you happen to know that policy and you can. I don't have the number, but I'll get it for you. Okay. Yeah. yeah Chad, mm -hmm. I, I think we do owe it to the community who has emailed us and who have come to Board of Ed meetings for the seven of us to discuss it. And um, 
I would just ask Steve to add it to uh, probably the April agenda because the March one's probably at this point pretty uh, pretty much settled. Yeah. Um, that's that's how I would do it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you guys. This was a great um, presentation. Ladies, you did a wonderful job um, really kind of painting a great picture of what happens at the 912 level. And um, um, I think you um, should be commended for all your great work. And I know that there's more to come. Yay. Yeah, echoing that, Tina, I just want to say, I, part of our job is always to like poke and ask questions about the things that we have concerns about. But like, holy cow, so much of what we got to sit through in the last uh, series of these meetings is really cool and getting to see all the ways in which you're working so hard. I could say that about all of you, but e even Kara, just pointing out all the, the boning up you've been doing over the last months on how a library should function, like hats off to you. So thank you for taking the time to walk us through this. And sorry if you feel like you're you know, always, always walking a gauntlet, but we really appreciate the information. It's so helpful and it's exciting to see what our students are being given every day. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so, so we're going to switch back to the agenda. You, if you want to stay on, you're welcome to. But we're just going to follow, close out the presentation or the meeting with just a couple curriculum updates and some additional highlights that are happening um, in the school. So um, March is a very busy month in the area of highlighting some great things out in the schools. We have music in our schools month, and I provided a summary sheet that is linked to this um, presentation so you can see some of the great highlights that are happening um, throughout the throughout the schools you may have all, patty falber is here you may have uh, gone to the um the most recent um uh, musical uh which or was it a play i'm sorry patty musical cinderella cinderella yeah, thank you very much i wasn't able to get there mm -hmm. um we also have so there's a whole bunch of different other um ways that we're highlighting music in our schools month. We also have Read Across America month. So there's a whole bunch of different um, a series of ways that we're highlighting and celebrating literacy across the district. We do that all the time anyway, but maybe some new exciting um, activities that are happening in the buildings, many of which uh, like we have guest readers, we have author visits. Um, and so you'll see that that link is also provided in um, the agenda for you today. And then finally, which is um, a really exciting um, aspect um, that you'll get a firsthand look into on Friday, is April 8th is the partial solar eclipse that we're going to experience in Weston. Um, you all parents will receive a letter directly from their principals outlining in detail some of the ways that we are celebrating or um, uh, engaging students in that partial solar eclipse. It's about, I think, 90, Beth, help me out if you're still there, 98% or 99% coverage. Um, maybe not. 90, 91%. 91, darn. I was hoping for more coverage. <laughs> um, but we um, we did, we were able to purchase um, official solar eclipse glasses for all staff and students so that we make sure that they're safe. Um, while they're experiencing um, that activity um, on the 8th, which is um, located at the end of the day. So I've got some, I've got the link to um, the details of the day so you can look at some of that information if you're interested, but you'll receive a full born um, uh, letter from the principals, which provides uh, more detail and some resources around the solar eclipse that will happen um, on April 8th. Um, and so moving into April, we've got some next steps coming up in April. Uh, beyond maybe the, a tech conversation that will happen, we will be providing you with an update regarding the math pilot, the math core curriculum pilot that we're doing in grades one through five, give you a status update on that. And then April also kicks off um, some state standardized testing for Smarter Balanced. And um, by that time, SAT will have been completed and also next generation science standards. So I'll give you an update on that as well. And that concludes the agenda topics for today. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Chad or David, do you have any other closing comments or thoughts? No, I think I used my time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's, that sounds good. Well, thank you so much for the, um, the technology and literacy, digital literacy update and We'll look forward to uh, next month's meeting. I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. Good seeing everybody. Good to see you all. Thanks, everyone. See you later. See you next week.